Wonderful to have you back for what happens to be our 220th show on human humane architecture on uh, ThinkTech Hawaii. And you might be close to be our 12,000th viewer. Isn't that exciting? So um, we are also uh, in our, this is our Veterans Day week edition. So um, couldn't be more appropriately that one uh, of our uh, panel members here from uh, live with us from Long Beach, California, Ron Lindgren. Hi, Ron. Hello. So um, we celebrate you because you went to Vietnam for us back then. And so thanks for that. And we honoring you and all your comrades. But you wearing uh, multiple hats because we have you with us here uh, just as much as the leisure leg and legacy uh, of having designed uh, the most intriguing hospitality design projects in, in Hawaii and beyond all over the world. And we also have uh, from the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, his uh, employment uh, place, DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. And we have me, your host, Martin Despang. Would you wish uh, being close to Munich in Germany, half around the world? So uh, let's get up the first slide because we are in the volume two of our show and looking how uh, you are fine uh, project the Holly Kalani Ron has uh, turned out and in fact survived um, after its uh, a remodeling, uh, which has been going on for the past year. But we want to uh, frame this with uh, the all German but adopted by you guys uh, term of Zeitgeist. And I've been using the, the motto of the Holly Kalani a management who said uh, the, the remodeling was under the sort of guidance or model of shades of white. So that somehow when I started to give different shades of white to that slogan there, it kind of seemed zombie to me. And this is something I want to po po point out as kind of the point of discussion about the zeitgeist. We, we agree that you can only identify a zeitgeist after the fact. But let's try the almost impossible to being in a time and imagine how one would look at us uh, when you look back. And uh, we want to do this because in many shows of the recent past and ongoing, we uh, identify the phenomenon of um, basically, uh, well, you can, depends on how you want to call it, but we call it the, um, the pandemic of um, guest room remodeling intervals that as our exotic escapism experts, Zana keeps telling us that every seven to 10 years, all the hotels seem to swap out all the interior, uh, throw it all away and make it all new so it looks novel and people would look in. So let's uh, contemplate about this guest room here that we have in front of us, Ron, and you gave it a lot of thought, so jump at it. Yeah, uh, the first time I saw this particular image, which is an advertising image, that very first quick impression was of, I would say, a tastefully designed and comfortable space within what is a rather ordinary standard size guest room mod module. Now that sort of sounds like damning with faint praise. And it is for me, because when I looked closely at the photograph and studied it, it appeared that the room is so genetic in appearance that the design gives absolutely no indication of where this might be located. And I mean, in the world, either physically or culturally or climatically, I couldn't find any hint uh, of where I might be in the world. Now, this design follows along a sort of uh, unhappy temporary uh, tendency that I've observed in hotels in the last decade or so, where guest rooms, no matter where they're located, their interior designs have become sort of homogenized. And you might also say gentrified. Uh, and the sameness is, is bothersome to me. Uh, I, I guess if, if that throw that's shown on the end of the bed was like an American Indian blanket, I might have guessed that it was in the American Southwest, 
Uh, Martin, with, with all the wood that appears in the room, you had some thoughts on where this room could have been located. That might be in the Pacific Northwest where we have abundance of like light colored wood, spruce or pine. But I'm also assuming along with a the blanket, there is carpet on the floor. So it must be a really cold place, might be in the Rockies somewhere, right? Who knows? Maybe we find out later down the lines of the show. Yes. Should I should I interject something here, or should we just keep going? Oh, please. And not, no, uh, please. I, well, I, I was I was going to say we do have to let people know that this photograph has been altered. The original picture has had something taken out of it by Photoshop. So the thing that was removed is what really shows you where this hotel room is. But I also wanted to add that. I always find hotel rooms very cold wherever I am. I mean, physically cold in temperature. And I will try to adjust the temperature to make it less cold and it usually doesn't work. So regardless of where I am in the world, I usually have to use those nice thick comforters on my bed to stay warm at night. Yeah. And it's possible that this place is like that too. It might be. And I think in, in sort of respect of when you have... There's lots of generic places. I mean, no, no, no offense. Any place in the world is thinks it's unique and it probably has some uniqueness. Of course, every place is different, right? But as far as what you look at from your hotel room, there's probably many places where you're just looking at interstates and freeways or whatever, right? So you want to basically distract from that and you want to overload the hotel room, which was one of your criticisms, Ron, right? There's so much, there's too much. There's just an over celebration of the TVs. And we're just saying, you know, Rockefeller, when he was doing the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel, he was saying no TV in there, not to distract from the real gem, which is the view, the beautiful view. And uh, that lasted supposedly for 30 years, that mandate of no TV in there. While here, not only is there this huge TV hung on the wall, but they make this sort of huge wooden canvas to even overly celebrate and emphasize that, right? So again, if you wouldn't have given us a hint, uh, DeSoto, once again, this seems to be in a really generic location because they did such an effort to not make you look at that sort of very boring context there because they want you to feel good in the hotel room when the hotel, so they, you know, they want to keep you happy in, in the room because it's so not boring outside. And I have to say that, again, in, in looking at that, uh, that image originally, I, was, I felt that there was uh, that sort of preponderant use of built-in fixed case goods uh, gave a kind of institutional aura to the room in that uh, the first thing I thought of when I saw this was that it was a, a very upscale college dorm room. <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, there is such a thing as warmth and solidity and uh, elements in, in, in the room that uh, are there. I think there, there's just too much there there. For example, when you called out the, uh, the slightly protruding wall that is a backstop for a TV and a dresser that is at least three times larger than it needs to be for someone coming to Hawaii, as far as their clothing needs. Uh, and across the, across the room was a very uh, direct decision to use a platform style bed. Now inherently with that sort of bed, it can't help but sit solidly and I think too heavily on the floor. Uh, and that's my comment about the dorm-like aspects that caught my attention. Exactly. And so not to spend just uh, one show on just one slide, although this discussion would make it well worth it. Let's jump to the next slide and let's open it up and redirect it back to your project, Ron. But once again, frame the zeitgeist context. So we're talking 80s. We threw in at the middle on the right, uh, Docomomo, um, you know, posted uh, of the 1970s turning 50, which has happened now, but we are saying give it eight to nine years, then we're going to face this with the 80s and what's going to be our attitude. And, you know, postmodernism, which is, you know, the attribute of the time, means different things to different people. As for you, DeSoto, and that's what the show quote in the center, the little one stands for, for you, it was Memphis. 
You, Ron, at the beginning of the year had been talking about Philip Johnson's iconic postmodern high rises. And in a show that we called Honolulu, Miami, vice versa, we've been looking at this most sort of schizophrenic and you might even call it bipolar example of Architectonica who were doing a hermetic microwave uh, international style glass high rise on another tropical beach in Florida and then basically pimping it or decorating it with these colorful little gimmicks there. And the most you know, dramatic is that, 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 that shotgun hole they were shooting through it, right? Um, we see you, Ron, at the very, uh, you can barely see, but I wanna point out at the show quote picture at the bottom right, at its uh, bottom left corner is you uh, sitting there looking at a building that reminded us um, of that Architectonica building and you might, uh, you you mind repeating what your what your comment was, Ron? Well, I've I've sort of admired a, a lot of the architectonical work uh, because it some of it is very zany, in mm -hmm. a, a good sense, and I I found that particular uh, high rise with the hole in the middle, and the hole actually is a pool terrace up in the sky, uh, to be a really good joke. But the yeah. building we're looking at in Hawaii, which was uh, a an attempt to be zany, I don't know. I just found it to be <laughs> a failed bad joke. Absolutely. And next slide. Um, Postmodernism is an is an iffy thing, especially for the ones who had their prime era in it as far as their their life like me for example i went to school when postmodernism had just tanked but it was still lingering around so i have a really ambivalent um you know attitude which you know sh could stay my problem but other people my age have the same problem and even the next generations bill chapman for example who uh, basically gave you i think uh, one of the best compliments you can ever you know, get Ron is that he called you, um, uh, if not, you know, one of the, if not the best postmodern architect. And that basically really means something. And I think this picture we took recently is, is really a great because it shows to the left the Lures uh, house that you renovated in a really sort of a critical way, not historically correct, but interpretively. And then on the right side, we see that part of the hotel that is by its programmatic nature, introverted and hermetic, which is all the conference room where you don't you know, get natural daylight, you don't get natural uh, ventilation. And you basically kept that very honestly, just a blank wall, didn't pimp it, didn't de decorate it, but then you put this performative lanai in front of it and that one, I, I find, uh, you know, once you're very collegially respectful with your postmodern peers, which, you know, thank you for that. But for me, still postmodernism will always stay ironic or polemic or sarcastic in some way, which you have never been. But this is a detail that speaks for your, your attitude being humorous and eye winking. I find this a perfect the best collage of that I've ever seen in postmodernism. But we also see at the very bottom right show quote, there were there was something distinct along with it. And these were draperies uh, slash curtains. And let's go to the next slide and 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 make you miss something, Ron. Yeah, I of course I give great credit to uh, hotel management and their design team in the sense that on the columns of these porticos or, uh, or porches, wherever they appeared, the uh, custom lighting, uh, all in a, a beautiful uh, bronze by a very fine designer, Leslie Wheel, they all remain. And there wasn't uh, some attempt to upgrade the lighting. Uh, rec there was recognition that there was a timelessness about these uh, fixtures and the quality of light that they do provide. Uh, but, and then on the columns, uh, and uh, you can see other little dribs and drabs of, uh, of, of bronze uh, items, and they actually held some draperies uh, against the columns. 
Uh, these were uh, a sort of uh, specially treated canvas drapery that required no maintenance. Uh, it's a legacy of the wonderful interior designer, uh, Robert uh, Egan. And they didn't occur very often. They occurred on this porch in front of the, uh, of the conference rooms and the ballroom above. They occurred uh, in the pedestrian entry uh, pavilion, which is shown behind your image, Martin, on that uh, slide. And uh, they're not there. And I'm, my hope, of course, is that because all of the, the fittings are there just to rehang them, that they will be rehung because they were such a wonderful, and again, a kind of an eye-winking blurring of the distinction between indoors and outdoors. And then they added the all-important residential touch and scale to what is billed as, for a hundred years, the house befitting heaven. Please restore them. Exactly. Uh, let's yeah. just give and I the think benefit too, of the doubt and say they're only in the dry cleaning still, right? Or I, by now I hope they're, that, they're back. I hope right? that that's the case. And I, and I want to say too that they add uh, a little bit of warmth and a little bit of softness to an environment which is largely hard and concrete and terrazzo and elegant and nice. But that little bit of movable fabric, I think, is a very important touch in an otherwise fairly austere setting, which is one yeah. of the things I think is very beautiful about the Holly Kulani is that it is so stripped down and in thus becomes very elegant. Yeah, and that setting, uh, let's go to the next slide and look at that courtyard space here. We surprised you in last week's show, Ron, in uh, telling you that you're a like-minded fellow soul, soul from Daryl Hall and John Oates. And um, I, I'm a proud owner of one of their live uh, DVDs that was recorded in LA, which is your town, Ron. And so um, in the opening of a song, they basically um, say um, to each other, nothing has changed in here, man. And that is exactly how I feel about what we see here, Ron, right? And elaborate on that one as the creator of it. Yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, can, can humanize uh, any sort of space is when things are moving in it. Uh, DeSoto mentioned the fact that the uh, canvas drapes did move slightly in the wind, and that enlivens things. But Here's a version of tropical elegance that I've always uh, admired uh, in terms of the Holiklani's president's choice that he did not follow up ideas that were pressed on him. Very, very, uh, uh, well, land, a, a number of landscape architects thought that spaces created in the Holiklani should be filled with this sort of jungle-like version of tropicality, which can, of course, be very beautiful, uh, and some of it is even sort of self-maintainable. But the opposite of that is what Chuhei Okuda, the president, loved so much. He went to other hotels around the, around the islands, but he fell in love not with the hotel, but he fell in love with Iholani Palace and the lawns around it, but especially the moving, ever-moving shadows of palm trees on uh, stretches of lawn. For a hotel, of course, those stretches of lawns or courtyards, as we've, we've described them, uh, are also outdoor rooms used functionally. The one we're looking at at the moment, uh, facing back towards the uh, pedestrian entry, is a wonderful setting for literally hundreds of Hawaiian weddings every year that have been held at the Holly Klani. Yeah, and that being said, let's go to the next slide because the... The wedding, the, the, the broom and the bride, they actually process up this element here, which is a staircase that's just in the corner of the right corner of where we were just were before. And this way, we also return to Leslie Wheel and one of her chandeliers. That is, again, um, as you've been sharing with us, a, a beautiful interpretive way of a, a mixture of uh, tradition and modernity. And if we go to the next slide, which shows 
the similar, uh, it's exactly the same architectural detail, but in the opposite corner, because this is opening up to the other courtyard here. And these are, uh, Ron, our favorite uh, spaces and places, at least in the public areas there. And we've been, I've been spending significant amount of time contemplating in these and just sitting on the stairs. And as the show quote on the previous uh, slide on the top right was pointing out, we've been there together. And these always struck me as being so um, ambitious and being so playful. I mean, I've been seeing these being just suspended and hung from the ceiling. And when the winds pick up, they're like swaying and swinging in the wind like crazy. And I don't know if you want to push something like that in these days with all this paranoia of liability and lawsuits and safety and stuff like that. I'm not sure if you could do this as well as the light. Um, the, the light systems in there seems to be still light bulbs, right? And maybe they've been switched. There are ways to make LEDs look like light bulbs, but that would mean even more. They're really staying true and sticking to the original. And so really kudos to the to Peter Shandlin and the management in, in, in really recognizing that and not saying, oh, you know, there is this expanded metal. And by the way, you told us it's brass, by the way. You know, and that sort of expanded metal, maybe, you know, that's out of style, it's out of date, we need to refresh that. So let's go online, let's go to the newest catalog and see what most people like and do that. They resisted that temptation and that takes a lot, right? I was going to say that it, it was a wonderful opportunity for me to work with a lighting designer who looked at the context, the architectural context and made very architectonic light fixtures. And of course, uh, the interior designer for the hotel was also <clears throat> an architect, not an interior designer. His interior design work, which was considerable, was secondary to his architectural work in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And I just want to add and something about this particular. And let's go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Final slide. Okay. One more thing, too. The, what you oh, see you in can the stay background. On that one. Keep going, DeSoto. Okay, the, the thing that you see in the background of that picture, which we saw in the previous picture, which is really exceptional for the Holly Kulani and Ron is to be thanked, is the open space, which is astonishing and unique for Waikiki Hotel right on the beach. And that the Holly Kulani has this space and that you can use this space and that you can go there for cocktails in the evening and look across a lawn is an amazing thing, which really sets the hotel apart Ron, you resisted the temptation to fill the entire property with buildings. Thank you, because that's what makes this hotel so wonderful. It, partly, uh, I, I was really guided by the fact that I did see a scheme previous to mine of what the Holly Kleine might have been. And of course, in, in the simplest sort of way, that scheme, which was rather handsome, uh, was another 30-story tower uh, which was the maximum height you can go, uh, you know, sitting next to the Sheraton. And yet that immediately guided me to the fact that let's tear that down, put it into pieces and emphasize space, precious space uh, and public space and useful space, not only uh, to have a wedding on, but just to look at. Uh, for its sheer beauty as the palm tree shadows uh, play across the lawns. Uh, yeah, what, what an opportunity I had. And, and I could have blown it, and I don't believe I did. You didn't. You did not. You didn't. We agree. And let's do one more slide, our final slide, next slide. Uh, because if you proceed from the staircase, and actually this is between the two staircases, this is rather, once again, like you said, it's sort of generous outdoor space uh, for these gatherings, predominantly um, uh, weddings. And we have uh, this sort of uh, row of show quotes up there that, that give us an idea about the tradition of this very sort of Killingsworthy, uh, Lindgren, uh, Stricker, Wilson, uh, starting with Brady, even at the very beginning, but you guys developed it actually to full fruition is that sort of architecture integrated uh, landscape through these planner troughs. And starting from the top left to the top right, 
The, we insist to still call it Seaside Hotel, not rebranded to the Shoreline, still has it. The Ihilani has it in this sort of where the gym is, but unfortunately, uh, the, the troughs on the exterior of the hotel are currently without of plants, at least in the atrium, every other floor still has them. The Manalani in the recent $200 million renovation, they threw it all out pretty much and de-jungleized it. And if that wouldn't be enough, you, your beautiful Kapalua Bay Hotel is entirely gone. So given that kind of tragic background, again, kudos and thank you, uh, Hale Kalani, to having retained that. And once the plans, just like in your front yard, which we talk about in a couple of volumes ahead of us of this show here, once this green is back, it's actually uh, camouflaging the guardrail. So it's the absence of architecture and the presence of nature. So how much, how, how more fitting could it be for the tropics? I must say too exactly. that uh, so many hotels, not only are those that were designed in the Killingsworth office, did provide some uh, trough-like uh, features. And they, it seems like management decides that they are too expensive to maintain. And yet I make the rejoinder that this hotel room you're staying at might cost 400, 500, 600, 700, $1,000 a night. And you can't afford to maintain some tropical landscaping I just find that completely bewildering and it cuts away from the tropical experience you're having and that you are expecting and is everywhere in Hawaii when it's allowed to happen and to be maintained. All right. So with that, we're at the end of how far we can go and get today, but we will continue our flaneuring through the recently remodeled Tali Kolani designed by Iran. And we're increasingly um, optimistic that nothing has changed, man, as Daryl Hall, I think, was saying it to John Oates. So with that, i see you back for that, for our continued uh, scavenger hunting in your hotel, Ron. And until then, please stay as uh, erotically, tropically exotic as you did with your design, Ron. Thank you. And thank you, Peter Shandlin, of having kept it. Have a good week. Bye. Happy Veterans Day, Ron and everyone else protecting us and see you next week. Bye-bye.